All right, I'm Harvey back. Dawson. How's it going, my man? Good. You have a good time doing a Monster Instructor Series and jamming with us? Yeah, always a good time. Cool. Man, it was really, really exciting for me to to connect with you and, and work with you on preparing for this series because you and I had never met before. True. Like we'd never connected at all. And and so we had some chats on the phone and I you know, we're always really excited when when instructors are seemingly equally excited to come work with us. So that that was step one of, all right, cool, Harvey Dawson is in. Uh, because I'd always heard so many awesome things about you, never got to meet you, and then all of a sudden we're chatting on the phone and, phone and we're working towards this thing. And from the first time I actually got to hear some of your recordings, watch what little bit is, is out there of you on YouTube, and then actually see you play in person, the thing that resonates in my mind uh, from the first time to all the sessions today is just how free and how much fun you're having. Um, I feel that in most of my years in pipe band drumming compared to other styles of percussion, that what's emphasized is the rules, the box. And regardless of what your goals are, whether you're trying to win stuff or just do things, whatever, Number one, there's all these rules, and you have to learn the rules, you have to learn the game, and you, you have to follow those rules, and most of them have less to do with making music and being yourself and being expressive. All these things musicians are taught, none of that matters. You have to follow this rule list. And yet I watch you, you're a beautiful player, you are the definition of a monster drummer. You have an, a, a very individual flair and style and sound, and, and you, you seem very natural in that state, that there are no rules. You are only having fun. Can you talk to us about that? Can you talk to us about how Harvey Dawson is just being Harvey Dawson when he drums? Yeah, for me, drumming is almost a state of mind. It's, uh, it's not euphoria, but uh, it's a state of being. Um, and I, I've met other drummers in the same way, um, that they are at their best when they're drumming. Um, you might have had a bad day at work. You might have got a cut in pay or your best friend got laid off the job, but you get that 14 inch therapy when you get home. <laughs> or no matter how bad your week was, Sunday is a day of 14 inch therapy. You yeah. and 10 other guys beating the crap out of a 14 inch drum yeah. and having a good time. Yeah, um, Yeah. I, uh, I think one of the reasons I've had some success uh, is because I've broken the rules, mm -hmm. you know. Um, mm -hmm. I remember the first time I played a solo contest, oh, many years ago, and I didn't start with two three-pace rolls. Mm. And uh, it was a three-judge contest, and two of the judges didn't like the fact that I didn't start with two three-pace rolls, mm -hmm. and the third judge loved it. Mm. So, you know, um, if, you're, if you're going to be an innovator, you're going to pay a little bit of a price. Um, but I remember John Kerr once told me that, you know, innovation is best served a, uh, a quarter of a thimble full at a time. Mm. So make sure that you measure and use your innovation tickets wisely. Mm. Um, and it's worked out well for me. I've had a chance to incorporate movements that are different or, or whatever, or awkward or whatever. Um, I see myself as a drummer's drummer. Mm. Um, and oftentimes the players that last the longest in my drum corps are the same. Uh, they're playing all the time. Mm. Whether they're in a drum corps or not, they are playing all the time. It's still fun for them to drum. Yeah, it's got to be fun. Yeah. Why, why would you do this if it wasn't fun? I, I, I try to talk to people about this all the time because especially if it's uh, players who, who are at a certain level of, of achievement, right? They have a certain level of ability. Um, and, and I really do try to talk to people who have completely different approaches from my own, which, I mean, inherently are people that are, are bred from pipe band culture, because mm -hmm. I am not. I love the music, I love the drumming, I'm committed to it, but I'm not bred from that culture. So I love talking to guys who are, who have a completely different approach. And what I'm always trying to get to is, hey fella, you don't look like you're having the best time in your life. <laughs> and yet you're here doing this. You spent a lot of time and money to be here doing this. Can you tell me why? So I don't use those exact words, yeah. but I but that's the subject I'm dancing around because I want to know why are you doing this yeah, the, if you're uh, not having fun? The typical pipe band drummer is hunched all over his drum. He's grimacing because he's fierce and he's so fierce. loud and angry. 
Um, and I don't think that is where we want to be. I don't see any problem with putting my shoulders back, putting my head up and yeah. smiling because I'm having a good time. Yeah. I don't see any problem with that. And let's get to it. Let's get to it. How about the material itself? I mean, there, I, I don't think anyone could argue that there's hardly a, a, a dose, an ounce of, of the style and the vibe that you bring that fits into the, the current mold. I find it refreshing. Um, just because, you know, I'm not a judge and we're not here to critique or do any of that stuff. I'm just here to, to learn about music and learn from guys who also love music. And, and to me, it is remarkably refreshing. And then if we want to really get, you know, super nerdy about it, it's awesome. You know, the technical level and the musical level of things that you play, because throughout the densest material that I've seen you work through, um, there's nothing that is strain away from the tune or strain away from, from purpose, from meaning. Yeah, musicality has to come first. Um, I think some of the mistakes I made when I was younger was putting out a very technical performance. Mm. And I would get the odd lecture from the odd judge that mm. said, son, you've got the best hands in the field, but you, I didn't hear the music in your playing. So I spent a lot of time going back and trying to be more musical mm -hmm. and play with as much expression and heart as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. And um, what I learned was I can do that and play crazy material if I want at the same time. Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up playing all Alec Duthert music and being very much accused as being a Duthert drummer, mm -hmm. another Duthert clone, you know. Um, and it was Alec who told me, you know, go see John Kerr, he'll show you some funny wee buzzy rudiments, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was John who said, go see this guy, and another guy who told me to go see that guy, and go mm -hmm. see Alec, and go see Jimmy, and go see Luke. Um, and like a pianist who would learn uh, Mozart and Bach mm -hmm. and Tchaikovsky, I sought out the greats. Who mm -hmm. were the great drummers that put their name on pipe band drumming? And, you know, spending some time with guys like Bobby Ray mm -hmm. was really great. Um, you know, uh, Jim Hutton, spend guys, some time with Jim. Jim had a real attitude and, and, and was incredibly diverse. Um, you know, these are the guys that open up your brain a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. um, and ever since then, I've been doing the same thing they've been doing. Yeah. I've been looking for different ways, faster, better, more open, more closed. Even you know, now. More combinations. You know, awesome. and the guys in my core will tell you, oh Christ, I hate September because he shows up with new shit that we've never seen before. Yep, yep. It's going to take us a month to get our hands around <laughs> it. But to me, that's the whole gig. Absolutely. You know, if I were into racing motorcycles, I can tell you right now, I'd be modifying my motorcycle like crazy to get it to go a little faster or a little smoother or a little louder or a little quieter, whatever. Yeah. And I'm just doing the same thing with two sticks and a pad. It's the same thing. How, how do we how do we help other you know pipe band guys and gals out there? balance that with we need to do well in competition. We've talked a lot, you know, uh, about being being a good team, being a good organization really does start with your why. Mm -hmm. You know, you're you're a grade 4 band somewhere planet Earth. Why? Why are you here? You know, what what are your goals? What are your priorities? And if you say our goal, our priority is to be competitive. Well, okay. Does that mean you're aiming to be in the grade one circle as soon as possible? Does that mean yeah. you're aiming to be, you know, top two, top three in your field each weekend, whatever the case may be. But, you know, once you get past that, once you can answer your why, set your goals, then how, how would you help uh, some of those lower grade bands balance being creative, experimenting with new technical things, but still being successful in the circle? Yeah, I, I work real hard early on with goal alignment. Mm. It's easy to stand up in front of a crew and say, okay, we're gonna be the best drum corps at the so-and-so parade this year. Mm -hmm. well, what does that mean? Yeah. Like you've gotta be able to break that down. And sometimes best drum corps might mean we've got the best drums in the best formation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or we look the best, right? <laughs> or we play the cleanest together, or right. whatever it is. So to me, you've got to be very clear on goal alignment. Yes. But once you have goal alignment, you should be able to have an alignment question. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, everything you do takes you back to, will X help us achieve goal Y? Mm -hmm. So if my goal is to win the world championship, it's real easy. Mm -hmm. If somebody says, Harvey, you think we should get new drums this year? Will new drums help me win the worlds? If it won't, I'm not interested. 
Yeah. If it will, I'm interested. So it's yes. real easy to sort out the wheat from the chaff. And that yeah. doesn't have to be a world championship. Like sure. I said, it could be yeah. the best drum corps at a parade. Absolutely. It could be merely to put out the best quality performance we can at a yeah. graduation or an inspection or whatever it totally. might be. Yeah. But I would say be very clear, crystal clear on what that is. Absolutely. And once you have that, it's easy. It's it's a, Then you set a plan. Okay, sure. so I you self-assess. Here's where I am today. Here's where I want to be. And you build a plan on how I'm going to get there. Right, right. Um, I know in our core, um, we've got some very specific things we want to accomplish this year. Mm -hmm. So we set out a plan. We're going to do these five things. And, you know, we're going to have two of them done by Christmas. And we're going to have the third one done by March. Mm -hmm. And then once I have that objective broken down for March, and I know that I'm working on it between November and March, mm -hmm. well, then it gets easy. Then I say, well, how many practices do I have? I have 11 practices. Okay, so I've got to do this big thing, and I've only got 11 chances to do it. Mm -hmm. I break it down into milestones. So we, we plan it like a business. Yeah. We execute like a business. Yeah. And we're and constantly And you guys measuring. determine these things and these milestones together? Yep. You get the feedback, and then you assemble the plan, yep. right? Yeah, that's cool. I mean, there's nothing worse than having a lofty goal. You know, I'm a right. grade four band. We're going to win the grade two world championship this year. You're right. Not, you know, it's, right. You know, and a lot of bands make that mistake, right? They just set stretch goals that are just too Well, they do or they, right. they aren't as specific as what you're mm. speaking. You know, for a band to simply say, uh, we exist, our why is to compete. Yeah. Well, again, you know, does that mean you're in grade one in a few years? Oh, no, no, no. Okay, well, then what does that mean? You know, how does that look for your community? Because that gets into the conversation of why you don't have enough players, why you don't retain players, why your student base is so low. Yep. It's because you're not clear enough on, on what that why is. And it's interesting, right? We started this conversation with these cool, unique, creative things that you play, but it always yeah. comes back to why. Yeah, why you, are you doing it? You, it's really hard to improve something you can't measure. Yeah. And it's hard to measure something unless you're very specific. Yep. It's like saying, I want to lose weight. Yeah. We all want to lose weight, <laughs> right? But the question is, how much weight, precisely, right. by when, yeah. and how will I measure yeah. so I know I'm making appropriate progress. Yes. Because I might be measuring and get to a point where my goal was to lose 10 pounds by Christmas, right. and here we are, second week of December, and I've only lost two pounds. Right. I'm never going to make it. It's time to replan. As soon yes. as I realize I'm not going to make it, it's time to replan. Okay, my goal won't be 10 pounds by Christmas. It'll be five, and five's going to be tough because i got three more pounds to go, right. and I've only got two weeks. That's fine. It's nothing yeah. wrong. Nothing wrong with a stretch goal. Yep. But if you're precise with your goals, you can measure. Yep. And to me, it's all about being your worst critic. Like for example, we record every practice. We record every play. Um, I can tell you the number of hours of every top and bottom snare in yeah. our core. Yeah. So that we know the wear rate of all the snares and when to change them. Yeah. And we know that if half of them are going, we're not going to change half and leave the other half old and only have half new. We're going to change them all and keep them consistent because we know. For us, a consistent sound is one of, our, one of our big goals. You just brought up two really awesome tools I think that any band could use, doesn't matter what your goals or your grade are, uh, because I, I think the, the line you know, from all the, uh, you know, the business gurus is, if it's measured, it can be managed, Yeah. right? And so those are two measuring tools you just outlined that any yeah. band could have. And so measure tool number one is um, have a method of assessment of your rehearsals. Because if you're not recording your rehearsals, you're just spinning in circles. Oh, I think that sounded better today. It, well, what? let's go. Yeah, what? What why, specifically how, is better? What, what are you thinking, right? And, and, if, and if so, yeah. you say, well, you know, the stress bay was a little clearer today than it was last week. Where was it clear? Well, the third part was clearer. Where in the third part was it clear? Well, the right. third bar of the third part, I think we played a little better. Okay, could I hear a recording of today's third bar of the third part? Can we compare And last it to week's two weeks third, week, yes, third bar absolutely. of the third part? Like, I would like proof and evidence. Yes, absolutely. You, know? you think the stress bass too fast? Can we hear the tape? Yeah. Let's actually be objective and assess it. So that's one tool you just outlined, which is great. Record your practices, Always. whether it's your band rehearsal or you know your individual practice at home. Then the other thing was having to do specifically with drum gear. And you know, our, I, I like to think that most pipe cores, even lower grade pipe cores, are much more systematic about assembling and, and you know, mm -hmm. uh, getting their instruments ready to sound their best on the day. I don't think we're nearly as systematic as drummers and we need to be. And whether that means sh putting Sharpie on the day the heads went on, yeah. having a spreadsheet online, whatever, but just randomly putting the heads on, maybe yeah. two heads today, three heads next week, 
it's not gonna work out. You can actually have tangible measurables and you will sound better if you yeah. implement those things. Yeah. Many times have I you know, judged a novice player mm -hmm. and I'll say, your bottom head, I can see your bottom head is massively stretched. Yep. I can yep. see the bearing edge yep. an inch below the hoop. Yep. It's stretched so badly. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll say, your bottom head is very stretched and over tensioned yeah. and it's double toning and your bottom snare is so tight I'm mm -hmm. hearing a low aftertone every on every accented yeah. stroke. And they'll say, but it's not broken. <laughs> Why would I change the head? Right. So to me, and again, and it may not have been a goal of theirs to improve tone. Absolutely. Maybe their goal was strictly to play better and we'll just leave the instruments rot maybe, while we learn to play Maybe we better. don't have enough money to buy new heads every yeah, year, maybe it's which, which veers do a different conversation about yep. organizational budgeting. But you know, it, it's still, it's, it's something that any band can do to improve right now. Because this is something I, I feel like I hear a lot from lower grade bands or bands that are trying, they feel like they're struggling to climb up and that is we don't know what to do. We don't know how to make it happen. And certainly there's a knowledge base that needs to be had. You don't just know how to tune a drum, just like you certainly just don't know how to tune a set of pipes. You have to know how to do these things. But, but it becomes a list of priorities set on your organization's goal. And we're not talking about buying all new drums, heads and sticks right now, but small purchases on bottom heads, snares, sticks. Mm -hmm. I mean, boom, you're a better sounding band. And then tracking how long you use them, how long they last, can radically improve your uh, whole sound. You will learn things about your consumables if you start to track them. Boy, it's, like say, it's like saying, you know, you don't realize how much sugar you eat or how much bad food or whatever fast food you eat yeah. until you start writing your diet down. And yeah. you go, oh my God, how I have many fast Oreos? food burgers three Yikes. times a week. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. So it's, it's the same with pipe and drumming. Yes. But to those bands that feel a little lost, I mean, Sometimes there isn't a guru in your neighborhood who yeah. can help you out immediately. Yeah. Um, I would say don't be afraid to go to, like if you're a grade four band or a grade five band and you're starting out, find a grade three band in, yeah. your, in your locale yeah. and ask to go to their practice. Absolutely. Can I just come to your practice? I want to see how you guys work. Yeah. And, and you know what, if you ask a few questions, so let me get this straight. You do sectional work for a little bit and you work out the rough spots and then you get together as a band and you work to see where the medium spots are and then you play on the instruments to refine the sound. Is that what you're doing? And you can ask questions mm -hmm. and once you sort of get the yeah. feel as to what they're doing, nine times out of 10, most of it'll make sense. And yeah. some of it won't. You yeah. might find that that band you're visiting has a bad practice and you're saying, I don't think we're gonna do that. Yeah. But I like this other thing they do and let's incorporate that. Let's that. talk about that for a second because I, I know that a lot of bands, um, let's say, don't feel a strong sense of community with their neighborhood mm -hmm. pipe bands. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this seems to be a reoccurring theme too as well because we're, we're so competitive, it's, it's hard to make friends. Mm -hmm. And again, we wonder where the recruiting issues come from. So. What advice would you give to, again, you know, local pipe band community anywhere in the planet where they're not the only game in town, there's other bands of various grades. How, how can we reach out? How, how can we communicate better? How can we work together more cohesively so we can all do what we want to do respectively in our bands? I would say do things that are not competitive. So mm. for example, yeah. our band does a fundraiser, a pub night. Mm and we invite players from our competitors, other bands, awesome. to come in, come up on the stage and give us a few tunes and play awesome. a little bit. It's not a competition. Right. It's just we want to hear you play. That's excellent. And we'll let you come and hear us play. And Great fundraising idea. Again, the, the difference is we get the money at the door. Yeah, That's the course. difference. We'll, we'll get you a beer, but yeah. Yeah, thanks for coming. <laughs> right? And you'd be surprised how many of your competitors will show up. Yeah. Sometimes they want to show up to hear you play. Mm -hmm. They want to check mm -hmm. you out. Right, right, right. And that's okay because yeah. when they play, we get to check them out. Absolutely. So I would say do things that are not competitive. I like that. Uh, festivals, fundraisers, all kinds of things. Most yeah. pipe bands are broke. They need the money anyway. Yeah, absolutely. So, and maybe get together with a competitor and say, yeah. hey, why don't we both do a fundraiser? Let's you do play thing. at ours, yeah. we'll play at yours. Yeah. You know, we got some guys in the band that play guitar, yeah. and they can play guitar with pipes. And you got some guys that can play congas, and they can, and boran, and djembe, and yeah. they can play percussive instruments with our pipes. And yeah. Start to mix it up a bit. Don't stick to the old March Strasbe and Real and Six Eights. Like, do something different. A, it'll get more variety to you, it'll, totally. it'll be more fun, totally. and you'll get out of the rut. Cool. I, I think that, I think that's awesome advice again for any level of band. Yeah, yeah. Now let's talk more about some of the the music of Harvey Dawson. So, can you tell us just a couple of the albums that we have probably heard you play on, and oh. maybe didn't realize Harvey Dawson was that guy jamming those beats? Oh, 
uh, uh, going back to Shots albums, uh, McNish albums. Uh, What's your favorite? Like, what what album do you look at or listen to that you feel the most proud of? Oh, I don't know. Um, live in Scotland and Live in the Maritimes, the Megantic Outlaw, Live in the Maritimes, that was mm -hmm. a fun album. We had a lot of fun doing that. Cool. Um, and we did we turned it into a number of tours before mm -hmm. we went to do Live in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So we got ourselves more polished. And it gave the drummers, you know, one of the challenges of pipe band drummers is they, um, they usually lack performance experience. Mm -hmm. So as soon as right. they play in front of a crowd, mm -hmm. they get nervous. Right. And when they're nervous, they play at 60% of their talent. Yeah. yeah. So if I can make them comfortable with playing in front of strangers, like yeah. a gigging drummer would yeah. have no problem doing, yeah. now they're playing at 90% of their talent level all the time. Right. So it gets easier for them. It gets totally. easy for everybody. Totally. So I've done crazy experiments over the years. Um, there was a time in T&D where I remember the Algoma band folded and Big Jim Brown sent me his four drummers and I got a note on a Saturday in the, in the post and I'm reading it at breakfast and it says, Dear Harv, Big Jim here. I'm sending you my drummers. I want you to teach them and blah, 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 blah. They'll be at your practice on Sunday, whatever. And I looked at the date and it was that day I was having breakfast. So I went to practice and sure enough, there was a pickup truck with the four of them in a pickup truck wow. saying, uh, Jim says you're going to teach us. And they were all good lads and wound up being great drummers. Um, but uh, we played our first competition and all four of them sort of folded like a cheap suit. Oh. They had no experience playing mm. in front of a judge, let alone a crowd. Yeah. Uh, and they were crazy nervous, palms mm -hmm. sweaty, the whole bit. Yeah. So I remember taking three of them. I was living in a condo in the High Park area at the time, across the street from this giant park. Mm -hmm. And uh, on a Saturday, I had the three of them play with me at the front gate, mm -hmm. and we played the MSRs over and over and over and over, <laughs> all day on a Saturday with hundreds of, or thousands and thousands of people coming by. And again, they started out really nervous and careful in the mm -hmm. morning. Mm -hmm. But by the time we got to the evening, it was no big deal. No sweat. And we did that two or three Saturdays in a row. Yeah. And uh, we didn't have the problem at the competitions it's, at the end of the season. It's remarkable, right? I mean, the, the quick parallel I often make is uh, if you'd like to shoot better free throws, shoot more free throws. Yeah. You have to learn how to shoot free throws, yes. But once you get to that point, you just need to shoot more free throws. Um, and the 10,000 hour rule. Well, there's certainly right? the 10,000 hour rule. <laughs> and, and absolutely, I mean, that's, that's a real thing. And, and, and then many people would say, I, I just, I don't have 10,000 hours to devote to my drumming. Okay, well, then you might need to reassess your goals. But, but without di uh, diving back into that, um, th there, there's a certain angle that you can take um, that, will, that will allow you to figure out what is most important to you. It's just like you said with losing weight. I want to lose weight. Well, we need to be more specific than that. I want to be better at drumming. Oh, okay. Well, what, how do you want to do that? How? The, the, well, for, certainly, a good step one is play more. Play more could be five minutes a day. Just five minutes a day. Yeah. By doing that, you'll be better. I want to be less nervous at competitions. Okay? You need to, com you need to perform more. Yep. And, and again, I mean, that, that checks off so many boxes for so many bands. How do we raise awareness for recruitment? How do we make more money? How are we less nervous at competition? Yeah. We do better at competition. Perform more. You don't always have to be, it doesn't have to be a paid gig, but do those local parades, call up the high schools, call up the colleges. Can we play in front of your front stoop for half an hour? What can we do to get our people out of the basement, onto pipes and drums for the people in our community? Yeah. And, and the beauty is um, just getting out and playing. Mm. Oftentimes people will pay you for doing yeah, that. Yeah. Often at times. So now you solve the finance problem exactly. a little bit. Exactly. You solve the stage fright problem mm -hmm. a little mm -hmm. bit. Oh, and by the way, the number of reps you need to get better, you just solved that too. And what you and kill some, three birds. Someone just came up and said he plays drum set in a rock band and has never seen pipe band drumming. That yeah. looks really cool. It does a lot of really good yeah, it's things. It's a great way to recruit too. You'd be surprised. Absolutely. Yeah. So that that's another cool thing to talk about that we some of us have maybe heard on some of your albums that you performed a lot for us today, and that's some of your drum salutes. You have a really cool approach to composing and utilizing drum salutes, this modular approach. Everyone needs to check out that class because that's, that's super yeah. cool. But speak to us a little bit more about that, about how influential the drum salute, the drum fanfare has been to you and your students and guys over the years. 
Yeah, um, I got into pipe band drumming because I was in a, in a symphony and someone was playing on my concert snare and I went to thump him out and by the time I got there, he was playing a lovely 6-8 march and he had very good crushed rolls that I had never heard before. Um, but that aside, um, what I learned was uh, young drummers will play the drum fanfares 10 times as much as the required concert figures or, yeah. or uh, competition figures or parade figures or whatever. So the trick is, um, it's a trick. Um, take the material that they're worst at, organize it into a rhythmic, syncopated way to practice that combination or that rudiment as best you can. Mm -hmm. And they will practice the crap out of that fanfare before they yeah. ever do anything else. And why is that, Harvey Dawson? Because uh, it's fun. It's fun. We drummers like fun. Yeah. You know, would you rather play or which uh, which is more fun? It's yeah. pretty obvious. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if you can incorporate um, you know, drumnastics, if you can mm -hmm. incorporate a little bit of choreography, if you yeah. can bring in other types of drums or start playing with plastics or yeah, something, yeah. it makes it even another level more fun. Absolutely. So if if you just fail to innovate, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, you're going to die. You're going to lose players. Yeah. Players don't want to just play March to Space and Reels. Yeah. They want to play all kinds of other stuff. I, I, it seems to be that... So bring it to them. Totally. Pipe bands, like all things, are, are in this evolve or die sort of scenario. But, it, but, but to innovate you know, for a, a little band with limited resources doesn't mean reinvent the wheel. No. You know, it just means mess around, experiment. What, what do you find yourself doing when you're just messing around on your pad? What does little Johnny or little Sarah drummer do naturally when they're all by themselves, no one's watching, and they're just messing around on their pad? Whatever they're doing is not the competition sets, but just listen what they're doing. And, and I mean, I can certainly say for me, for many, many years, when I was teaching in public school, when I was trying to find the thing that's gonna get that student on board, that gets the, where they catch the bug, right? For some kids, it's the high octane stuff, right? I wanna be challenged constantly, striving for excellence. Those kids are fine, you just need to guide them, right? But, but the kids that are just, they know they're not as committed, they're, they like it, but they don't love it, what do they need? And I always try to kind of hide and see what they do when they're when they're alone. Are they gravitating toward the vibraphone? Are they playing snare drum and whatever instrument? Then what are they messing around with? And then how can I utilize what they do naturally? And I think we can do the same thing in pipe bands. Yeah. I think we can see what we do naturally and make use of that. Yeah, for that player that's not motivated, I try to give them a win. Mm. What is it that they can be the best at? Yeah. There's something. Yeah. Find that thing and compose something or write something just for that for them. That's the trick. I dig that. I think if they get a, an ounce of success, yeah. they know they can be more successful. That's a great way to put it. But they gotta get an in. ounce or otherwise. That, that's a great way to put it. What, what gets them a win? What makes yeah, that person, give them a win. Just give kid, them a win. adult, it doesn't matter. Yep. What's a W feel like to that person and how can you give that to them? Yeah, maybe they can't play paradiddles, but they can play triplets fairly well. Yeah. Great, let's put a little piece in the fanfare on triplets. Why? Because they're gonna play it great. Everybody else Absolutely. is gonna play it okay, but they're gonna shine. Absolutely. Let them, give them something they can shine at. And then, by the way, we're gonna play random cues that nobody can play well. You know, that kind yeah. of thing. So we'll, you know, a little bit of sugar with the medicine, you know, works every time. I love it, I like yeah. that. So Harvey Dawson, you seem very aware and influenced by other genres of music, other very facets much. of drumming. Sure. Clearly, the guys that you've studied with, most notably Duthert, very aware, very you know influenced by other other guys outside of pipe bands. Um, how how can we do that today? The challenges today, of course, are man the the competitions get more fierce every year, no matter what association or what circle you're in. And good Lord, there's an awful lot of things to distract us. We have lots of options in life these days. And this is a challenge, not just for young people, I think anyone. So how, how is it that we, if we're in pipe bands, we love pipe bands, we're committed to the music, we wanna do well, carry on, you know, carry the torch. How can we budget the time and be just as motivated by all these other worlds around us like you and, and the people before you were? Yeah, I would say have no fear. 
Um, I remember when I was a kid just sponging every great player I could find. Yeah. I would ask Alec who to go to and I, he would tell me this person and that person would tell me another person. But oftentimes I would hear somebody else and say, mm. wow, that's really cool. Who is that guy? Where did he come from? Yeah. And I would find out who he plays for. I'd get his music. I'd find out where who taught him and where he learned from, yeah. his pedigree. Mm -hmm. right? And I would seek him out and say, hey, you know, I really like your score for so-and-so. Um, could you teach it to me? Yeah. You know, I'm going to learn it on my own. Like, dude, I'm going to learn your score one way or the other. Yeah. But I'd rather learn it from the composer than right. misinterpret half of it right. off the page. Right. So, uh, yeah. I, I, like, I would encourage all the people, all the subscribers in the Monster series, if you see something of mine that you like, message Monster, uh, Rhythm Monster, and say, hey, I want to learn this score from Harv because it's his score. Totally. Or I want to learn this score from Reed or from Alan and, or whoever. And man, we're, we're happy to do that. I mean, we, we feel like that that's part of our responsibility ability if someone sees a monster instructor and goes whoa I need more of that yeah, exactly. they need to be one click away from communicating with you and and I, I will continue to provide those resources yeah. because uh, it's really interesting that people who don't have the luxury of hanging out with Harvey Dawson or whomever they, they just have this immediate impression oh, I, I, can't, I can't talk to that guy Know. You know, I mean, they're just, it's its distant. I can't do that. Skype, and, and I mean, we're here to say, <laughs> yes, you can. And now there's no excuse. Click, you're there. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've got students in China. Like, uh, I, I was crazed away when this fellow Yan had, had called me. Hi, hi Yan, if you're watching. Um, and, and I thought, I said, oh, great. Uh, and he said, well, uh, I said, you know, snow's probably piling up. And he said, oh, no, it's nice here. I said, oh, if you don't mind my asking, where are you from? And, you know, he's in South China. Excellent. I was taken aback. You're yeah. where? And, and you play in a band, right? You play in a pipe band. Oh, yeah. And he sent me a recording of his whole band. I think it was a grade three, grade four band. They had a pretty decent band in South China, of all, cool. of all places. Yeah. So, you know, Skype is a wonderful thing. It is. You can be right next door to someone from China, and you can hear them clear as a bell, and they can hear you clear as a bell. And absolutely. It I mean, it, it would seem that the vast majority uh, of the, you know, top of the art form level players want to share, want to help others learn. Um, you know, everyone has their own ways of going about it, um, but everyone seems to be willing to to help out. And I mean, certainly we have, we, have, we have new tools every day to try to text call or communicate with people. And again, we try to make that as easy as possible, especially with the guys who are kind enough to come on and share their music and message yeah. with us. And the beauty is for a lot of the basics to fill in the gaps between yeah. what your instructor is telling you, Yeah, you got Rhythm Monster. Yeah. Go on Rhythm Monster, get five or six sessions done, then go back to your instructor and say, hey, I yeah. spent some time in Rhythm Monster. Guess what? My Rhythm cues are way better than they used to be. What yeah. do you think? Yeah. You bring up a good point, man, because we... You know, we try to make it as clear as we can. We are not a, a replacement for private instruction. It's music. It's an art form. You must have that one-on-one -on -one connection. Right. What we are, we're your motivation to practice between your lessons. You know, I mean, you don't need to learn flams from Harvey Dawson, except maybe once. After that, go work on flams. Yeah. We got lots of flam classes for you. You know, yep. choose your concept, ditto. But yeah, we we don't we don't replace one-on-one -on -one lessons or Skype lessons, whatever, we supplement the time in between so you can work on anything you want anytime you want. Yeah, I would say when you want to learn to play flams into an open role, then call me. Yeah, that give I can, Harvey that a I can call. Help you with. <laughs> That's that right. I can help you with. That's right. That's more my gig. But and yeah. if, if you get enough students calling you about it, maybe we'll make a whole series then we'll of do, classes. We'll do an that. online thing when we get enough. I don't scale. I'm one guy. So, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's right. Thing. We that's can help thing. you with that. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Harvey, seriously, it's it's been an absolute pleasure uh, hearing you perform, hanging out with the Peel crew, just getting to know you better, your message, your music. I mean, it's all wonderful stuff. And, and I love that, you know, you made a decision. I want to focus on the high end of the art form. Yep. I, I don't see enough innovation and advancement and virtuosity. I want to focus on that. And of course we said, absolutely, let's do that. And I love how in all of your classes, you made a point to say, now, if you are a beginner, A, don't be trying this, not yet, but come back when you're ready. Take some inspiration from what's happening here. And then a couple times you even said, go do something better than me. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. Um, 
There are lots of instruction sources, or at least in Ontario where I am, there's lots of instruction for beginners. Yeah. There's lots of grade five and grade four and beginner and, and yeah. novice juvenile instruction. What I've seen in Ontario is a lot of drummers learn from their lead drummer or their instruction mm -hmm. or instructor. Mm -hmm. They get to a certain point, maybe to grade four, mm -hmm. and then they join another band and there's mm -hmm. a new lead drummer who they mm -hmm. learn from. And he gets them up to grade three maybe, or maybe even grade two if they're lucky. And where do they go from there? And I've seen so many drummers who have stalled in grade mm -hmm. three or grade two, yeah. and they become lifetime grade three drummers. Yeah. They never planned on that. Mm -hmm. They just never got that extra instruction to get them over the hill. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's my sweet spot. I think yeah. my spot is helping those players get to the next level. How do you get from paradiddles, played well, and maybe mm -hmm. played open and fairly fast and smooth, mm -hmm. into parabuzzles, into a roll, at roll speed? How do you get from, how do you cross that chasm? Into, outlining the melodicism of a tune in your head with yeah. the muscles and, and muscles, yeah. To me, there for me personally, there was a change in my technique that got me from grade three level thinking and playing mm -hmm. into open level thinking and playing. Right. And much of it isn't your hands, much yeah. of it is how you're thinking. I yeah. find many of the drummers in my drum corps over the years, they just weren't thinking right. Mm -hmm. They had good hands, they yeah. just couldn't think the right way yeah. to get over that hurdle. Yeah. For some of them it was technique. How they were holding the stick and how they were moving their fingers and what their fingers were doing wasn't helping them, it was hurting them. Yeah. And again, once they adapted their technique and started thinking a little differently, all of a sudden these things that were preventing them from getting to that next grade, yeah. all of a sudden things got easier. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that, that drag tap run that used to stall them all the time in the grade three solos. Now they've mastered drag taps so they can move faster into different ones or whatever the case may be. Yeah. So to me, that's, and that's the kind of people I want to help because I yeah. know I'll impact them. I know I'll change sure. their drumming career yeah. and they'll just, they'll, dis they'll take off. And, it, and it's great for me to see the enthusiasm that comes yeah. from the students. You can do that? Yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, it, that, that sort of aha moment, that sort of click, it's, it's life-changing. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I remember once we did a concert in Ballymena in Ireland, and I was fooling around backstage, and one of my drummers told one of the local grade four kids who were there, saying, yeah, he can play drags into a roll. And the kid said, no, he can't. I think his phrase was, that's not natural. <laughs> Humans can't he do that. So he came over with a bunch of kids. He goes, Harvey, could you play the drag thing into a roll thing for him? So I did. And there was four or five of these young lads and their eyes were bugged out. And, and my whole message was, you can do this. Yeah. You just, you're not thinking the right way. Yeah. You haven't adapted your technique yet. Right. But when you do, you'll be doing this. And, that, and that's the best and message I think you could ever hear um, from someone that, that has the you know the the musical prowess and artistry of you is so can you? Yeah, uh, that was the message I got when I was a kid when yeah. I went to see Alec. I thought I was a grade four drummer and I was the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> and I, and Alec schooled me in thirty seconds. <laughs> and I remember thinking, how does this old man, who's barely holding on to the sticks with the tips of his fingers, have so much speed and power and expression? How does he do that? Because I'm doing this <laughs> and I can't even begin to keep up to his speed and his power. How does he do that? Yeah. And when we went to the schools, I, I mentioned before, yeah. we, went to, we went to the schools, we'd be playing all afternoon and we'd be, ah, ah, I'm so tired of playing all afternoon. And Al could be at the top of the class doing this, barely moving, not even breaking a sweat. Yeah. And we were like, wow. This dude is so far ahead of us. Yeah. And it took me and other players many, many years to understand what Alec meant by fingertip control. It took us so long to get that. And, and today, more and more people learn that faster. Every yeah. generation gets better and better yeah, and better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have a very good friend of mine whose 14-year-old son has gone through the grades in three years and he's about to play in grade one. And there aren't too many 14-year-olds playing the grade one. Goodness knows. So Harvey Dawson, you've mentioned to me a couple times that you often see players plateauing. The drum sergeant build up new band, yeah. drum sergeant build, you know, there's this logical progression. And um, I, I, I think I've seen that as well. I, to I totally understand what you're saying. I think part of the problem with players getting to that grade one plus er area is application, meaning there just aren't that many grade one bands. I mean, I, I believe right now in 2019, there's less grade one bands on planet Earth than there have been in 
decades. Correct. Uh, my opinion is some of these some of these situations are absolute anomalies. Some of them are completely predictable. We're just making the same decisions that's leading to the same results. Um, what can aspiring players do short of playing in a grade one band? Of course, nothing is going to replace great playing in a grade one band. And if you have the means, the commitment, the resources yep. to fly across the world yep. and do that, absolutely do that because you probably won't be able to do it your entire life. But let's say you, you don't have all of that and that's not the recipe for you. What can someone do who still wants to see how good of a drummer they can be but it's, it doesn't fit in their lifestyle to be in a grade one band. Yeah, I, I would say certainly playing the grade one solos. But what if so, there are no competitors, which is what we hear all over the place? What if it's just me out there at seven in the morning? What would you say to them then? So there's no competitions local to them. But you know what I'm saying? Let's say the, the, the competition itself is really not a competition. There's two or three competitors. It's, oh. a, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a real fun environment. I mean, what would you say to them to keep them motivated so it's it's more about what they're doing for themselves? Yeah, yeah um, it's like race car drivers mm -hmm. who compete against lap times rather than the other drivers. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them practice the fastest lap. They set their own targets and their mm -hmm. own goals. And when they reach them, then they go see how well they do against the best on the planet at mm -hmm. NASCAR or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would encourage those drummers or pipers to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Set your own goals for excellence. And now, and here's the beauty. Let's say I'm in northern Poland and there aren't too many pipe bands in northern Poland or northern Germany. Poland pipes and drums are yeah. taking it off this year, that's right. Yeah. Um, you know what? Use Rhythm Monster as a vehicle to find an instructor mm -hmm. who will critique you over Skype. Yeah. Set yeah. your own standard and tell your instructor, I'm a grade one player, I want to get to open, I want you to critique my playing and judge me like you would in a competition. Yeah. So find someone who's an experienced judge and do that, critique me in great amount of detail, and then help me get to that next level. And helping me get to that next level might be uh, composing new material for them. Yeah. It might be that their material's too hard for them. Yep. Um, you know, all different sort of scenarios. But that's the beauty of the internet, man. Yep. Just because yep. you're in bumfuck Idaho, so to speak, uh, <laughs> doesn't mean you can't get to Rhythm Monster or to Skype and yep. and get world class instruction. Totally, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. There are a lot of guys like Gordon Brown or Eric Ward, yeah, or all yeah, these yeah. great or Jim Kilpatrick, all these great players. Yeah. These people are available. Yeah. Get to them and ask for help. They'll help you. Awesome. Right. Just too many options. No more excuses, right? I don't think there's an excuse. Yeah. Now, maybe 30 years ago, we didn't have the internet. Yeah. And if you were in northern Poland and you didn't know of any competitions, nor any instructors, yeah, you were screwed, basically. Yeah, yeah. Nothing to do there. But now, there's no excuse. There's this thing called Google. Yeah, yeah. Google. Heard of that. Open professional pipe band instructor via Skype. Yeah. And I'll bet you'll get a few hits. You'll get me, but you'll get a few other guys better than me. Uh, right. You know, and by all means, reach out. We'll help. That's awesome. So, yeah. There's ways to grow without being in a grade one band. Correct. Uh, there are things you won't get on your own. Sure. You know, learning to core. Like, of course. Yeah. I, I had a fellow this year who uh, will be playing with another core. He won't be competing with us this summer, but he's practiced with us all winter. Um, and he's like that. He's been in a remote place. He's played solos for the last number of years. And he has, he's lost or hasn't developed fully the ability to listen mm. while he plays. Totally different skills. So he's concentrating so mm -hmm. hard on mm -hmm. playing the material well, yeah. he's off. And when he's off, he can't tell he's off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he's playing in a lower grade band this summer. And that's what he's going to do. He's going to develop his listening skills cool. and learn to blend, learn to fit in with the rest of the guys and sound like the rest of the people in the core. And when he's got that skill mastered, we'll take him back in a heartbeat and get him playing. Because he's got a decent set of hands, mm -hmm. but he hasn't developed the ears yet. So that, That's a real important distinction to make. I mean, you can certainly grow personally and with your own composition or performance etiquette, whatever it may be, but to core, to be in a line, you can only get that in a line for yeah. sure. Yeah, it's a skill. But those can be need. two totally different things. You can say, I don't have this available, it's not in my wheelhouse, so I'm going to rock out on yep. this. Now, I encouraged him to keep playing oh, yeah, solos. Oh, don't yeah. stop playing solos, oh, yeah. keep playing. Cool. I'm a big advocate, always have been an advocate of solos. Yeah. Solos is that chance for you to put everything you got out there yeah. and make mistakes. Yeah. And learn from them. And, yeah. and have some knowledgeable dude with a pen and paper tell you how you can improve. It's like a free lesson from some very experienced dude. And I would say the more solo competitions you can play, the better off you're going to be. I 
I love it. You're never going to get worse playing solos. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Last question for you, Harvey Dawson. What is a monster drummer to you? Um, I'm a bit of a technician. Like I said, I'm a bit of a drummer's drummer. Mm -hmm. um, Alec Dothard really sparked in me this concept. He always said, you should be a drummer, not a score player. And he says, and that means when I tell you to play flams, I'm expecting loud, quiet, fast, slow, open, close, dotted, cut, you know, round, every possible way of playing flams. And I remember him laughing, saying, you know, technically, if you could develop your technique well enough, you could play almost everything into a, at least an open role. Yeah. And I remember at the time thinking, God, easy for you to say. I, nobody could ever do that. That's, that's not something humans can do. And, but I learned he was right over the years. As you evolve your technique and get more fingertip control, you can play awkward movements like drags mm. into a roll. Yeah. You can do these things. It's not impossible. Um, so for me, that's what I look for. I look for virtuosos. I look for the Steve Gads of the world, and I can or the Vinnie Colaiutas, and I can watch these guys and go, wow. You know, that was 13 eighth, and he did it effortlessly. It's like yeah. he was chewing gum and half asleep at the time. And I'm like, <laughs> Wow, how does that guy do that? I love that. I love being wow. There's nothing like it. Or That's going cool. to the world solos, and I would encourage everybody go to the world solos and just have a listen. Yeah. Listen to some of the best soloists in the mm -hmm. world play. Mm -hmm. You might not be impressed by all of them, but I guarantee you there's going to be a bunch of them at the top. When you listen, you're going to go, whoa. Yeah. Listen how smooth that guy's roll is, or right? Yeah. Listen how perfect his flams are. Listen to the buzz in his drag. Listen to the, Brit the width of the double in his Rademacuse. Wow, they're incredibly consistent. They're exactly the same all the time. How does he do that? That's the stuff. That it's turns amazing me on. how much we can learn simply by listening. Yeah, that's what that to me. That's what turns me on, and that's what drives me. You know, people say, "Why did you learn to play flams into a roll or a roll made of triples instead of doubles?" And I just said, "Because Alec said someday somebody will be able to do it. And why can't it be me?" Yeah. <laughs> or, or I saw some other guy on YouTube, and if he can do it, I can do it. You know, he's human, I'm human. All I gotta do is figure out his technique. What technique did he use? And if I can't do it, guess what? I'm gonna call him up and say, dude, I saw you play a triplet role. How could you do that? I'm doing it this way, what am I doing wrong? Oh, I gotta lighten the grip. Oh, now I get it, and boom. So that's the monster drummer to you. Yeah. The real beasts. I love, the, I love that. I love the guys that can do impossible things. Love it, love it, love it. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, Harvey Dawson, it's been an absolute pleasure. Very Thank welcome. you so much, man. Very welcome. Been awesome. Cool. Thanks.